Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us at this Intelligence Squared Plus event. Um, it's a joy to be here this evening, particularly after a week where we've had a change of administration in the United States, so it seems, and also this afternoon's announcement of potential vaccines. I'm delighted to be joined today by Margaret McMillan, who is one of not just Britain's, but one of the world's leading historians. Uh, she's a colleague and a friend of mine from Oxford, formerly warden of St Anthony's College and professor of international history at Oxford University. And as many of you will know, is the author of, of many books, including Women of the Raj, Uses and Abuses of History, and perhaps most famously, Peacemakers, which won the Samuel Johnson Prize, the Duff Cooper Prize, and many others besides. We're here today to talk about her new book, uh, War, Conflict, How Conflict Shaped Us, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is what we're going to do this evening. I'm going to talk with Professor McMillan for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll go to questions that come from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Ask Question button under the video screen and type your question. If you want your interview mentioned, please type it in the box and press send. Uh, bear in mind, uh, I'm of a wrong generation for this kind of technical stuff. So if I get something wrong or read, don't read out your name, it's not intentional. It's just multitasking isn't necessarily my strong point. Um, for those of you following, it'd be great if you can tweet about uh, things that you hear or that stimulate you. If you do that on Twitter with the hashtag IQ2, intelligence squared two, uh, that would be great to make awareness of these great events uh, for future audiences as well. So first, I'd like to welcome uh, Margaret. Uh, where, tell us, where are you this evening? Uh, you're, you're not sitting in the, in the college next to mine in, in Oxford. Where, 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 where are you talking from this evening? No, I'm, I'm miles away from you. A pleasure to see you even at a distance. I'm in Toronto. Um, so it's middle of the day, beautiful spring day. I'm looking out um, at, a, at a lovely Toronto scene. So tell us, I mean, your, your, your book is fantastic, as, I, as everyone would expect, um, Margaret. It's got a huge range of topics. You cover um, chariots across the steppes. You talk about Mongols, the peace of God movements in the Middle Ages. You talk us through views that Mussolini and Goebbels have about the role of women and their relationship to war. How does one start writing a book that tries to talk about war? What, what, is, what is war and where do you start with a topic like this? Well, you start and then you think, what on earth have I done? Um, because there is so <laughs> much on war. You know, and I, 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 there were moments when I thought I'd really got myself into something that I'm just not going to be able to wrestle into any sort of shape. But I think if you're an historian of whatever period, war comes into it. And I'm a historian of the 19th and 20th centuries, and there's an awful lot of war in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so I've always been interested in how war affects human societies. And increasingly, I've become interested in how human societies affect war, because it seems to me very much a, a two-way street. It's not just that war happens and then societies change. It's that societies change and war becomes more or less likely. And so I see the relationship as, as a very deep one, almost chicken and egg sort of thing. You can't really tell which comes first, um, society or war, and which influences the other the more. I think they, they influence each other. And so I, I thought I will try and write something about it. And I was very lucky to be asked to give the Reef Lectures in 2018. And, and they, they, it's, it's, they say, which is wonderful, you can lecture on whatever you want. Um, and so I talked it over a bit. And I said, well, let me try war which is what I did. And then I thought, if I'm going to do it, I need to try. And I, I was trying to explain to myself and, and to an audience and then to people who might read my book, what is it about war? What is war? What is the essence of war? And are there things that persist about war, features of war that persist through centuries? And so that's why I range so widely. And I was very lucky, like, like you, um, I've tended to study big subjects. And so I've tended to study the international history of, of the 19th and 20th centuries. I studied the British Empire before that. And in my teaching, um, do not fall off your chair with horror, but for a while in my teaching, I was teaching the history of China. And so, which really let, led me to, to learn a lot about parts of the world I didn't know. And so it was an attempt to ask questions about war and, and perhaps explain to people why I think war is important. What are the interesting aspects of war? And one thing I was very keen to do was not just talk about the battles. You know, we, we, we so often tend to fixate on the, the great moments, the battles, the dramas, the retreats, the people, as you say, sweeping across the steps. And what I hoped to bring in also was, was those who were affected by war. I mean, the civilians are as important as the warriors, I think. And so what I tried to do, and as I say, there were times when I thought I'd really taken on too much, but I tried to try and look through history 
as far back as we can go at the sorts of things that war has done and at the features of war. And of course, it changes over the years, it changes over the centuries, but the certain things are the same. There are those who fight and those who suffer. There are the, there's the technology, changes in technology bring changes in war. And so I had fun doing it. As I say, I, uh, there were moments when I thought perhaps I'd been too ambitious, but it, it seems to me, I, I'm glad I did it anyway. But I mean, let's, let, let me. Uh, you start at a very provocative opening, which is which is any good book needs to have, any good lecture. And you say that war is not taken as seriously as it deserves. And you say it's not taken as, and it's ignored at a majority of Western universities. That that might come as a surprise to um, historians. So we tend to spend a lot of time focusing on, particularly the first and the second world wars. Uh, what, what do you mean when you say that war isn't taken seriously? Do you mean as a discipline? Do you mean in terms of defining what wars are? Do you mean in terms of what lessons we can learn from it? To tell us a little bit about what, how you open this book. Well, I think there are two senses in which we don't take war seriously enough. And when I say we, I mean people like me who have been extraordinarily fortunate. I mean, I have lived through probably uh, one of the, the most peaceful times in history for people in certain parts of the world. I mean, I spent much of my life in Canada or the UK. I grew up just after the end of the Second World War. And so I've lived through what a lot of people call the long peace. And I think for those of us who live in these very fortunate parts of the world, war is something that is far away. It's something we may think about. It's something we may see movies about. We may read novels about. Some of us may study it. But for most of us, war is something that happened either in the past or happens very far away. It happens to others. And I think that's dangerous. I think there's a sort of complacency that has crept in that we don't, we meaning those of us in this fortunate part of the world, don't do war anymore. And that reminds me too much of the period before 1914, when a lot of Europeans said, we're too progressive, we've come too far, we're too civilized, as, as they said then, to ever fight again. War is something that, you know, people in Africa do or people in Asia do. And look, look what happened. I mean, I think that complacency was one of the things that, that enabled the First World War to come and, and take people by such surprise. But I think there's a second thing that's happened, and that is the formal study of war. I mean, lots of people are still writing about it. If you go to bookshops, you will see row after row after row of books on war and various battles and, and books on weapons and so on. But in universities, and I think this is less true perhaps in the UK, but certainly true in the United States and Canada, history departments really don't want to study war. They see it as something that's about power, that is something uh, that isn't really going to help make society a better place. I mean, a lot of history departments now, as they've always had, I suppose, have a strong social mission. And so they feel they should be looking at things, issues of social justice. They should be looking at groups that have previously been marginalized. Or there's a great interest in cultural history, all of which is very interesting. But war is something that has affected the course of human history. But if you look at the passion of hires, people who have taught the history of war are not being replaced. I was talking to someone the other day who said that he suggested to his dean, his, his, this is a small Canadian university, the dean said, you know, we've got a problem. History enrollments are down. What can we do about it? And this friend of mine said, well, things that students really want are international history and the history of war. And the dean said, no, we can't go there. And so I think there's a, there's a problem in a lot of universities that the study of war is not seen as legitimate or, or something a bit distasteful. And I just think that's a shame because it will continue to be studied, but it may not be studied very well. Given your work on the, on the First World War, just to develop that, I mean, you, you write about the Great Illusion, the famous book written on the eve of the First World War that says uh, there's no economic case to ever fight a war again, and, and uh, there you go. I mean, you, it, it's quite a sober book. I mean, you, you repeatedly warn us of what the dangers might be and how important it is to be paying attention, not just to study the past, but for the relevance to the present. So I guess, I guess two questions on that. First, how do you compare this long period of peace we've had with the period up to the First World War? And second, are, are you um, worried, concerned about what the future has in hold? I know that's a different territory to step into for a historian, but how, how it seems like a book that's written with a specific warning. How do, so how do, we, how do we compare to the early 20th century now and, and, and to the warning you're giving us? Well, to answer your first question, I see a lot of parallels. And we know that history doesn't repeat itself exactly. But it can offer useful warnings. I mean, you know, I think John Gaddis, the great historian of the Cold War, once said, it's like a series of traffic signs. You know, it says, watch out, steep curve ahead, or be careful, this road is dangerous in winter, or flooding on the road. And I think that's what history can do. It can offer us warnings and, and instructive parallels. And I'm very struck, increasingly struck, by how much the world pre-1914 was like the world since about 1989. Um, you know, 
the world has known a long period of peace, or as I said earlier, parts of it have known a long period of peace. Europe had known a long period of peace. And the, the 19th century, even though there were um, short wars in Europe's history in the 19th century, in fact, it was a very peaceful century. It was probably the most peaceful century that Europe had ever known. And Europe had undergone tremendous economic and social and political development. More and more people were literate, more and more people were voting, um, more and more people were enjoying the benefits of a consumer society. And I think there just was a feeling before 1914 that we've come so far and so fast that we won't do war again. And yet there were warning signs. And this seems to me again very much like our time. I mean, there, there was, it, it was a very globalized period. The period before 1914 was the other great age of globalization. And there were already the strains and discontents that we've been seeing since 1989, um, populists appealing to um, chauvinistic feelings, a fear of the others, um, worries about revolution, um, worries about divided societies, worries about decadence. I mean, some of these are quite familiar to us today. And you also had national rivalries, great power rivalries, and you had great powers preparing for battle. I mean, they said it was a, for war. They said it was defensive, you know, that you should you need a big navy, you need a big army in order, order to defend yourselves. But once you have those preparations, I think then the danger is that you're going to use the forces that you've built up. And we're seeing something similar today. I mean, the United States and China is, is the one I think a lot of us worry about. And in both countries, you get people making the plans for a possible war. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to fight it, but they're thinking in those terms. And China, and the United States is, is the world's largest military power, but China is catching up. I mean, the Chinese, the amount the Chinese have been spending on their military forces has gone up hugely since about 2002. And we have hotspots. And again, that's what Europe had and the world had before 1914. And for Europe, it was in the Balkans or, or the Ottoman Empire. And I think we see the hot spots today. I mean, there's a hot spot in the South China Seas. There's a hot spot in the Himalayas on the border between India and China. There are hot spots in the Middle East. There are hot spots in the Caucasus. So, you know, I'm not saying history is going to repeat itself, but I think we should take some warning from the past and just think a little bit seriously about the dangerous situation we might be finding ourselves in. And you say, Margaret, that, that wars often they start for absurd or inconsequential causes, but behind them usually lie greater quarrels. When one looks back at the past, I mean, obviously the First World War is a great example of, of that too, but are there other cases in the past where, where you think that there have been moments where things could, could have gone in, in different directions? I mean, you, you pick on several different fracture points, like 1792, which hopefully you'll, we'll talk about it in a, in a bit as well, but the, the sort of the dawn of the modern age. What is it that's made people want to fight so often? Uh, what, what is it about mentalities that have led battlefield armies to go head to head and risk things? I think there are a number of things that, that come into play. I mean, one is when you get people in decision-making positions thinking that war is a tool they can use, that war is something they can use to achieve an end. And of course, they tend to assume that they can control it. And sometimes they can. I mean, the 18th century did see limited wars, which stopped after a certain point, and, and there was a peace treaty, and, and both sides came to some sort of understanding. But the danger with war, of course, is it's very difficult to control once you start it. Now, Clausewitz said war has its own logic. And once a war gets going, especially on a very large scale, it's very, very difficult to see where it's going to turn out, which, of course, was typical of the First World War. And I think also what is dangerous is when you get a number of unresolved issues in societies and you, you get... Uh, the rhetoric heightening, and you get a series of crises. And so people are psychologically prepared for war. They, they may not want it, but war has become a possibility. And I think that's very dangerous. And I think, you know, we, we know that when you get these sort of tensions, they can be negotiated. And Britain and the United States talked about war in the 1890s over the Venezuelan border issue. And there was, you know, inflammatory talk in the press, both in the United States and in Britain, you know, we can't take this, we must, you know, fight if necessary, but they didn't. And they came to an understanding and it basically was that Britain would withdraw from the new world in any sort of military sense and the United States would be the dominant power in the neighborhood. And that worked. So, you know, war is never inevitable, but I think you will get a situation where it's like, it's like a forest fire. You know, you get a very dry wood and then someone throws a cigarette out of a car, and you get a fire which nobody much wanted, but the conditions were all there for it. And yet, ironically, and it's, it's a very balanced book, you, you note that uh, wars produce lots of positive things, not least national spirit, national identities, and so on. 
how, how does how does that fit into the story story of war? I mean, that you have a rogues gallery of of uh, Mussolini, Goebbels, and everyone else besides. But I mean, you, you conspicuously avoid talking about good wars. You know, we tend to think in Britain that the Second World War was a good war because we fought uh, for good causes and the, uh, the opposition were all evil. But I mean, you you you're very balanced in explaining that actually wars are essential, have been essential in building modern states. Yes, I mean, the state, I mean, as one, uh, Charles Tilley, a very famous sociologist, said, war made the state and the state made war. I mean, you, the, the two go on together. I mean, to organize a modern war, you need a highly organized state. The more organized the state becomes, the more control it gets over society, the more capable it is of fighting a highly organized war. And again, the two go side by side. And so I think that's, that's very important. We can talk about good wars, but war itself is never good. And in wars, even if you're on the right side, even if, if the victory is for what I would consider the right side, and the Second World War, of course, is an obvious example, even the right side does awful things. Um, even the right side will do things that are cruel and wicked. I mean, the, the mass bombing of Japan and Germany was something that, you know, we still debate about, was it necessary? It was seen as necessary at the time, but I don't think it's something we should necessarily be proud of. And when we won, when the Western allies won the Second World War, they did so in alliance with one of the world's greatest tyrannies, the Soviet Union. So no war is uncomplicatedly good. Um, the Crusades were not good. And you know better than me just how appalling the Crusaders were as they rampaged their way through the Byzantine Empire, through the Mediterranean, through the Middle East. I mean, these were not people who were good necessarily in their cause. May have sounded good, but in fact, it wasn't good for those who are at the receiving end of it. So I don't think there is a good war. There are wars that are probably right to fight, and you probably have no choice, or the choice is an important one. I think Britain was right to fight in the Second World War because the alternative would have been so much worse. I think it fought in the right war and it fought for the right cause, but that doesn't mean everything about it was right. And so I think we have to be very careful about war. You know, it's very dangerous to glorify it, um, but people do. And the other thing that happens, and you pointed, I mean, this is one of the many paradoxes about war, is that once a war is over, we will often look back and say, well, it was dreadful, the cost was dreadful, but certain things that were good came out of it. Um, greater social equality. And, you know, a number of historians, including Thomas Piketty, have argued that the greatest social equality in a number of countries in the 20th century came as a result of two world wars, which compressed the differences between the poles and society. And we know that technology and science often are speeded up during war. We know that social change takes place in, in the position of women or, or the working class, for example, will take place as a result of war. It's a bit like some of the changes that are happening now with the pandemic. You know, changes are happening, which in fact are probably going to be desirable in the long run. You know, more support for those who don't have any means, more support for those who are out of jobs. I mean, these, in my view, are all desirable changes. I wish we didn't have to do it this way. I mean, we shouldn't have to need a war or a pandemic to make some of the changes we make, but it does seem typical of human nature that we need a big catastrophe to really focus our attention on sorts of things we, we need to do to come through it. I'm sure that that's right, that these great acceleration points give, uh, ex you know, they, they accentuate fragilities and they have all sorts of outcomes that they throw out, some of which are positive in the long run and some of which are hugely divisive. and and cause cause bloodshed but i mean why i mean you you have a section you have a chapter you write about the importance of technological advancements and you you talk about different inventions on the battlefield but what is it about human beings that make us want to innovate in ways in which we become more effective effective at killing each other or protecting each protecting ourselves what is it about our human condition that leads us to want to find ways to go from a spear to now nuclear or cyber that that could ruin each other's lives, yeah. kill each other. Suppose, well, it, it's, it's a fascinating question. And I suppose once we start thinking in terms of war, once we define ourselves as a group, then we want to protect ourselves against other groups. And I think the beginnings of human social organization actually help to lead to more organized war because you have something you want to defend, whether it's your settlements. And I think agricultural settlement had a lot to do with, with, with the increase of warfare because you can't move away as easily and it's something you want to defend. But you want to defend our, our group and you want to defend what we have, whether that's territory or people or wealth, whatever. And you may want to also take what others have. And so, you know, Thucydides said it. I think what he said, war is fear, interest, and greed. So fear, interest, and honor, I think, 
And I think there's something in that, you know, that as organized groups, we want to protect ourselves, but we may also, in protecting ourselves, want to move against other groups to absorb them or to take what they have. And I think this encourages us to go to war. And if you're going to go to war, then you are going to look for the most effective ways of doing it. And that means organizing yourselves, organizing your soldiers, training them however you want to do it, using what can make you more effective. And there's a huge difference, for example, when weapons began, began to be made of steel rather than iron or bronze, because they last better, they are more deadly, you can kill more people with them. A huge difference in warfare when the horse comes, because with horses, mounted warriors can move very quickly, they can strike at soldiers on the ground, they have a mobility which foot soldiers don't have. And so technology, I think, makes a huge difference in war, just as social organization does. But not all societies will adopt new technologies. There'll be a lot of resistance to it. You know, the British Navy didn't want to adopt steel ships because it thought they would sink. Um, you know, they, they, they had a sentimental attachment to the old sailing ship. Um, and it took a long time, I think, before the adaptation was, was actually made. And so how successfully societies adapt to technology depends on the nature of those societies and societies themselves. And sometimes the technology will come along but not really be adapted for a very long time. But of course, again, what war does as the social change speeds up the search for new technology. If you look at pictures of the war planes or the planes, they were even war planes, the little airplanes at the beginning of the First World War, little single engine things made out of basically sort of um, paper and, and balsa wood practically, by the end of the war, they are much bigger and faster and can drop bombs. And so war will speed up technological development, just like, again, the COVID-19 is speeding up the development of vaccines. And so, how, so you talk about the modern age, which you have, I hope you'll tell us, the, if you remember the lovely quote you have from Goethe, uh, of, of drawing a distinction about when the modern age starts. And one of the points that you make is that the new technologies that start to become available because of iron and et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, and gunfire, gunpowder, make us much more lethal, but it starts to involve more and more people. One, one would think it might be the other way around, that the more technologically advanced you are, the fewer people you have in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And you then tell us that, that you know, Stalin has six and a half million people fighting in 1944. Mm -hmm. What's the correlation between that modern era, the modern age, and how armies get used by states in warfare? Well, two things happened coincidentally, but fed into each other and affected each other. And one was the growth of nationalism. I mean, people began to define themselves as members of a, something called a nation. And we see it as perfectly normal. But in fact, it was very new in terms of human history for, for most peoples. I and mean, most peoples in much of the world would define themselves by their village, their religion, their clan, or their ruler. And what you get, and it comes partly with the American Revolution, but also partly with the French Revolution, is you get people beginning to see themselves less as subjects and more as citizens. And what the French Revolution does is, is usher in a new relationship between the French people and their government. The government is now their thing. It is something that they have a say in choosing. And of course, conversely, if you have a say in choosing your government, you also have an obligation to it. You have to defend it. And so you get this sense that something called the nation is an owner of its own government, it's a, it's, it's a master of its own fate. You also increasingly get the sense, and I think historians play a great part in this, in creating the idea that the nation is something that exists throughout time. It's not just something that appears on the map. It is something that has a, 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 perhaps even an eternal existence. And so you get German historians and German linguists and German ethnographers in the 19th century saying, there always was a German people, as far back as we can see. You know, the Romans had to fight the Germans, and, and they were the only ones who could defeat the Romans. Now, this is not good history, but it's very powerful. It creates a national story. And the more people divide, divide themselves into nations, the more they are, I think, willing to fight and die for that nation. So nationalism provides the ideology, if you like, that will make war on a large scale possible. But what the Industrial Revolution does is provide the means. And so what the Industrial Revolution does is it provides the means of communication, the means of production, the means to equip and sustain large armies in the field. And with the state of technology, I mean, it's changed now today again, but with the state of technology in the 19th century, you wanted lots of boots on the ground, lots of pe people, men, of course, in uniform, lots of guns. Today, having that many people doesn't matter as much, but in the 19th century, it mattered that you could put an awful lot of people into the field because you wanted a lot of people who could fire their rifles. By the end of the century, you're getting machine guns. And so 
the numbers were going to become less important, but not for a long time. And the Second World War also relied on an awful lot of people in uniform. And it's really this combination that, that brings about total war, I think. And you know, they almost they had to sort of find a name for what was happening. And in, in the First World War, people began to use this phrase, total war. This is a war on such a scale, drawing in so many of the resources from human beings to the products, the factories and mines and farms and fisheries, that you have to find a new word for it. And so total war, both because of the Industrial Revolution, which makes it possible, but I think also because of nationalism, which provides the motivating ideology, becomes something that is one of the features of the 20th century. And does that change the relationship between citizens and the state? as well, that the state starts to see human life in a different way, not necessarily expendable, which is a colder version of what re the, the reality is, but that having armies with hundreds of thousands or millions of people, it, it's it's a requirement of, uh, of the citizens to be able to defend the state. Is there a change as well in, in ideas about uh, the role of the state versus the citizen? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, it changes in a number of ways. Um, to begin with, states begin to count who they have. Um, you know, the census is introduced, and it's not just so you can, you know, do social benefits. In fact, it's very much so you can find out how many people you've got who are potential soldiers. And the state begins to define who's a citizen or not, because you have to assume um, that you can only conscript those people to fight for you who are actually your citizens. But also, and I think this is interesting, the state begins to realize that it wants healthy soldiers. And so a lot of the motivating force behind things like improvements in, in public education, the spread of universal public education, improvements in public health, um, are really driven by the need to try and produce healthy soldiers. Uh, the British public and the British government were horrified during the South African War, which started in 1899, when it turned out that a lot of the men who, who volunteered were simply unfit. And so there's a lot of public discussion about how do we improve the public health in our cities and how do we get better water and how do we get better public health. And so states begin to have to take more responsibility. They take more control, but they also have to take more responsibility for their citizens. And some of that is driven, of course, by electoral politics and, and by the reform movement, but some of it is driven by the need to provide the people who can fight and to make sure they're fit enough to fight and make sure they're educated enough to fight. And I'm curious, Margaret, when, 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 when one state, let's say 19th century Germany and ideas about the state and so on start to, per start to gather, uh, and produces um, uh, all sorts of different ideas of which militarism and fighting is one of them. That that clearly has to spark a reaction in neighboring states that has to respond and deal with what's going on in, in, in one country. I mean, do, do, is there this concertina effect that when one state becomes militaristic, that others have to respond either through arms races or, or being able to deal with a potential and real threat? I mean, are we all in it together that, that's we're not always masters of our own destiny. And it's all very well saying we should be mindful of war. But but in fact, if st states or great powers even today start to build up and invest massively in their military infrastructure, we don't have any choice except for to do the same. Yeah, no, I think that is a real problem. And you get a real sort of soul searching in a lot of European societies, not just about what sort of weapons we need. I mean, you, 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 you get arms races are very easy to start and very difficult to stop. And the danger in an arms race is that someone's always behind because someone brings in a new type of weapon and others scramble to catch up. And the temptation always is if you have an edge in the weaponry and the technology that you'll be tempted to use it before you lose it. Um, so that, I think, adds to the pressures towards war. But the other thing I think that happens is there's a lot of discussion in Europe about how do we ensure that our population is fit enough and motivated enough to want to fight for us. And in France, for example, which has, of course, very strong military traditions, after the 1870-71 war with the German Confederation, which resulted in a stunning French defeat and also the emergence of, of modern Germany, you've got a lot of discussion in France about how do we inculcate the right values into our young men and young women. But the, the men, of course, is the key here because it's the men who are going to have to go and fight. And so there's a lot of interest in having, I mean, some of it was silly, but sort of gymnastic clubs where people go and exercise and get fit and, and learn sort of military discipline. And across the continent, you got the establishment of, of sort of groups for young people. In England, the Boy Scouts. And if you look at the early days of the Boy Scouts, that had a very military fit flavor to it. Um, perhaps not so much today, but I mean, the Boy Scouts used to take a pledge to die for king and country, or to serve, sorry, to serve king and country, with the implication being that you might have to die. And so, yes, I think 
countries, the British were less touched, I think, by militarism than many of the continental states because they'd always ride on their navy and they'd, they'd always kept a small army and they'd never really admired the army all that much. But even in Britain, you get a spread of, of militaristic values. The idea that somehow the military are the best part of society, their values are the ones that we should all be adopting. It always strikes me when you look at photographs of, of Europeans before the First World War, the children are dressed in little military uniforms. They go to school often in little military uniforms. And virtually all the heads of state, um, with the exception of the British and the French, wear military uniforms. You know, you, you, and you look when monarchs get together, they tend to, to be in uniform. So I think there really is um, a, a permeation of, of militaristic values through society. And that can change, of course, over time. I mean, Germany used to be one of the most militaristic societies in, in Europe, and now, of course, it's probably one of the least. But I do think it can be dangerous because if you get military values being held up and if you get the military being admired, as the bravest and noblest part of, 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 the, of, of the state, of, of the country, then I think you, you get a dangerous situation where the military begin to run a little bit free or too free of civilian control. When you write about the, about the construction of the idea of the warrior, and uh, you compare that in, in, in another chapter about the role that, that women play, I mean, how, how, does, how do we understand the role, the relationship between uh, with gender, with warfare, uh, not so much from the point of view of is fighting a male thing, but how do women fit into the story of war? Well, it's so interesting, and I've been reading quite a bit about it. I mean, you know, there is the biological argument that men and women are different and, and men fight, women don't, which I just think is insufficient. And we have enough examples of women who have fought in the past and, and are fighting in the present. You know, so I don't think it's gender. But what I think is, is, is it's largely culture. I mean, women have been brought up to be the nurturers and support the men, and men have been brought up in many societies to be those who fight. It's an expectation. If you, masculinity in so many societies, you can see it even today, is tied up with being brave and being ready to go off and fight. Um, and so I think there is a very important cultural aspect here. But we tend to see women. I mean, I, I always get questions is, wouldn't the world be a nicer place if women were in charge? Uh, the, the assumption you made that we're kinder and gentler and nicer and more reasonable. I'm not sure I, I see it. Really, I'm not. Because so often in the past, women have acted as cheerleaders for war. You know, you, you, you think of the women who went around cities like London in the 1914-8 war, handing out white feathers to men of military age who weren't in uniform. Um, you know, the, the, the Pankhurst sisters, you know, who were working away, you know, mother and daughter, so the Pankhurst mother and daughter who were working away for women's votes, who did a complete shift in the First World War and, and urged men to go off and fight, became, you know, cheerleaders for the war. And so I think women play an important part. They bring up the children and they often, in certain societies, will inculcate or help to inculcate military values in, in the male children. And they often will encourage the men to go and fight. So, you know, I, I don't think that we're necessarily more peaceable than men. You, you have, a, have a quote from, from uh, Goebbels saying, man's trained to be a warrior and women as recreation for the warrior. But, I mean, it does yeah. seem that it's, uh, uh, that, I mean, you do, you do talk about um, Amazons, so the, so the classic female fighters and so on. But I mean, is, is this all about the way of, of violence? I mean, you start the book with Utzi, the kind of most famous, the oldest, um, mummified mm. corpses found, found in the Alps, who turns out not to have been on his way to pick mushrooms, um, but was yeah. sat upon and, and died of his yeah. wounds. I mean, is, is this, I mean, it goes back to the question about our, our human nature. How do we avoid, how do we choose confrontation? Is it, if it's not a male thing and linked to testosterone and to attempts to create social hierarchies, how, I mean, have we, could we look at it the other way around and say, actually, we're quite good at avoiding conflict and confrontation. There are ways in which a lot more wars could have happened. And, and in fact, these last 70 years show just how resilient how resilient we are at, at avoiding pitfalls. Yeah. Well, I think evolution can, can play out in two ways. I mean, evolution has given us, I think, the impulse to, to, of self-preservation. And that means you don't want to get into a war. Um, you know, in fact, one of the things that military training has to do is overcome that instinct of self-preservation -pres and make people prepared to go onto battlefields and risk their lives. And so I don't think, again, it's, it's biological. But the other thing evolution has given us is, is a tendency to lash out if we can't flee, you know, fl flee or fear. And if we're frightened, we, we sometimes will, will lash out. And so clearly there are biological impulses. But I think when you look at war, it's so organized. And it may use the violent impulses, but it keeps them under control. 
And in fact, it trains people to behave in ways in which they don't. So I think you know that, that war is something that, that comes with organization and comes with society. But on the women's side, I mean, there, there is a particularly ghastly role, I think, that, that women have played in, in war. And that is that they have so often been the prizes of war. And they've so often been seen as the reward for the warriors. Um, you know, and, and rape has been used as, a, as an instrument in war. It's been seen as something that soldiers are entitled to. But it's also been used deliberately, as we've seen in, in places like Bosnia in the 1990s, as a way of destroying the morale and, and, and the social cohesion of the other side. And so, you know, the, the role of both men and women in wars is a complicated one. But my own view is that, in fact, war, because it's so organized, is something that in many ways is running counter to our impulses and, and forcing us into roles that we may not normally want to be in. Yes, yeah, so there's a harrowing new book by Christina Lamb that I recommend to everybody to see the role that women have suffered in, in warfare. Just before I go to questions, I just remind you, if you have got questions to ask, please put them in the box and I'll come around to them. But the, the last question I want to ask is about, I mean, you mentioned um, the work of some historians like Stephen Pinker, who says, well, we're becoming much more logical and violence is all out the window and, and so on. How do you as a historian read that? I mean, you cover in this book more than 2000 years of history picking examples from every corner of the world. And you know, it, it you could look at the book like this and think, well, it's amazing we're still alive as a species, you know, our capacity to kill each other on such yeah. enormous volumes. Um, yeah. And so it seems sort of, in a way counterintuitive to think that actually we're getting happier, more peaceful. Are we just in a kind of interregnum? How, how do you deal with the work of historians who, who are trying to say that actually we should be looking at things uh, in, a, in a slightly more graded way, and that the horrors of the First and Second World War will never come back. But they have come back. You know, they have come back in Afghanistan. They've come back in Iraq. They came back in the Iraq-Iran War, which you know lasted for, for, for you know seven years. We, we've tended to forget about it. They're there in Africa in some of the wars that have raged there. They're there in Yemen. They're there in Somalia. So I think I mean I think there's a distinction to be made between whether we're more peaceable in our own societies, and I think. Violence is less tolerated in, in many societies, and that is quite clear. When we, when we no longer tolerate public executions, we no longer, in most societies, tolerate the sorts of cruelties and the violence that, that people in many societies were accustomed to. But that's not war. And I think we're still capable of making war. And I think the, the book which influenced me heavily was, was called The Goodness Paradox um, by, I think it's Richard Wrangham, who argues that we have become more peaceable as individuals but we've become, in a way, colder and more purposive in our war, that we actually fight war more effectively. That what we're like as individuals, we may be nice and kind and peaceable, but when we get into groups and when we have the training, we use war in a very purposive way. And so, no, I think, I think war is, is still very much part of our society. We may be nicer in individual societies and we may tolerate violence less. That doesn't mean war is going to disappear. Well, before I go, I've got one then cheeky question which is, you know, the, the point you make in war is that it's, it's for all the horrors, it binds countries together. And we see lots of countries that are highly divided at the moment. You know, I think some of us watching the presidential election were worried for the last six months or so that some form of existential threat to the US from outside, whether it's China in terms of trade wars or beyond, would help be a rallying call because it's quite a common way that leaders galvanize and, and mend fences by bringing people together. I mean, war could be used very cynically as a tool by political leaders to either consolidate their power or keep hold of power. Um, yeah. You know, is is what are the practical ways in which one can stop that from happening as a as a historian? Is it just to write about them and to warn? Are there are there ways in which historians should be listened to in power? It's a great thing that uh, President Biden to be has a, is a history major. I think that's very unusual for political leaders yeah. in the world today. But I mean, what advice would you give to an incoming or outgoing president about what lessons you can learn from war and how, how, how important it is to try to build alliances within states without military, without warfare, without confrontation? I think the best you could do is, is point to examples if they are willing to listen. I mean, I think history is, is a way of increasing understanding and, as I, as I say, giving warnings. And I think you can give examples of states that entered into wars where the burden simply became too much for them and, and the country collapsed and the regime collapsed I mean, Russia went into the First World War in 1914. It had a superficial unity. By 1917, not only was the regime collapsing, collapsing, but so, in fact, was Russian society. 
and they were then going to go through years of misery, civil war, and then the whole Bolshevik period. So be very, very careful what you go into. Even strong societies will find it difficult to sustain long and uncomfortable conflicts. And like you, I was very worried that the United States would see more violence around these elections. I mean, I, I found the appearance of our militia in the last few months very worrying indeed. And I found the escalation of rhetoric not so much on the Democrat side, although some of the sort of hard left, the Antifa people, I thought were, were, were deliberately calling for violence. But certainly the president himself, um, president um, still in office and hanging on by his fingernails, Trump, um, called, I think, deliberately for violence. And that really worried me. But I think, fortunately, American society has proved resilient enough. Um, I think it has weathered this storm. But it was a dangerous one, I think. And, and you know, it, there is still the possibility for things to turn, turn more difficult. I, I'm hoping not. I think the election of Biden is, is a very good sign. But it still is a country which is divided. And I think people should be careful. Don't set in motion things that you ought to know can turn out very badly indeed. I think there's been a lot of reckless behavior, quite frankly. Yes. Well, I'm going to turn to question. I mean, just to point out, we're talking the day after Remembrance Sunday, and, and that's normally a very important day in, in the UK and, in, and all over the world to commemorate how people have fought in the past and to, to think about the consequences of warfare and to to try to learn some of those lessons. So um, this 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 year, I know that the, the, the Chief of the General Staff, Sir Nick Carter, was asking people to go and stand on their doorsteps and wave a bit like we were banging pots for the NHS um, during during lockdown. But mm -hmm. I've got some questions here for you in very small fonts. I put my glasses on. I don't see a name attached to this one, but post this is for you, Margaret. Thank you for the fantastic discussion. Here we are. Post World War II, the people of Germany repositioned themselves also as victims of the Nazis, and West Berlin became the front line in our battle with communist Russia. Do you think China will do the same with historians focusing on 20th century nationalist China's history in an attempt to align more closely with the West? I think a lot of states use use um, history. I mean, I would argue that the, the Germans in West Germany did not position themselves as victims of the Nazis, and that was very much the line of the East German communist regime. But the people in West Germany, I think, took full responsibility and, in fact, were a model in dealing with a ghastly past and, and making sure that it was taught and, and researched properly. But I think you know a number of Hispanic societies do use history, not all. But certainly China does. It always has. And it draws, as you would know better than me, Peter, it draws on a very deep history. It draws on a deep civilizational history where China was the center of the world. And, and how much that is still underpinning Chinese action and thoughts, I think, is a very interesting question. But there has been a very interesting shift in the ways in which China is looking at the nationalist period and looking at the first, Second World War. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader who used to be vilified by the communists, is now being resurrected as a great Chinese nationalist. I mean, he, he wasn't a good communist, clearly, but he was a Chinese nationalist who cared about China. And the Chinese, I think, are increasingly portraying the Second World War as a good war for China, a war that China fought all Chinese together. I mean, this is a very simplified and, and indeed inaccurate picture. Is that the Ranamita book? Yeah, there we go. It's a, yeah, yeah he's, it's a really good book, I think, and I, I would encourage everyone to read it. Um, and yes, I think countries do often use the past to justify themselves in the present and, and to bring their people together. And we see it in China today. Great. And another China question from um, Mina Bowater here for you. Uh, is making an enemy of China a clever thing to do, bearing in mind that could set in train a new Cold War, if not a hot war, between East and West? No, making an enemy of China is not a clever thing to do. But treating China firmly, I think, is a clever thing to do. I mean, President Trump, who you can probably gather I'm not inclined to defend very much. But I think President Trump did hit on something when he said the United States needs to be firmer with China. You know, there's, there are issues that to do with theft of intellectual property. There are issues to do with um, unfair trade practices. I think this is important to call China out on. I and mean, China operates in a rule, rules-based system. It always talks about how it wants to exist with, with rules in the world. And I think it is necessary to be firm with China. That doesn't mean confrontation necessarily, but it does, I think, mean firmness. And I think the way to do it, which unfortunately the Trump administration didn't see, was is to build coalition, to build groups of those who, who will deal with China. And for the Chinese, I think, it's important that they realize that they can push as much as they like. Every country will try and pursue its, same, its own interests, but they can't always get what they want. And so it's quite possible, I think, for mutually 
unfriendly countries to work and exist together, you know, in a curious way, rather like a long marriage, the United States and the Soviet Union got on with each other by the 1980s. I and mean, they were still opponents, but they'd learned to coexist with each other and they'd learned ways of dealing with each other. And that's what I think has to happen with China. I guess the problem with that is that that didn't end up too well for the Soviet Union. And I imagine that the Chinese also worry too that, that you get outmaneuvered over the long over the long race. Yeah. Now, uh, Margaret, we're going to. So this is this is why you've got so many people um, here to hear you talk to this evening. You're going to be dancing around, I'm afraid, with the, showing your range. Uh, has anything good come of the Iraq War? No, I don't think so. I don't think anything that has good has come for the position of the United States in the world. I think the British have come to regret their involvement. And I think most important of all, nothing good as far as I can see has come for the people of Iraq. I mean, we may talk and people talk in the United States and Britain about how many of their soldiers were lost there. 500,000 Iraqis or more have been killed. And their society is still bedeviled with um, division, corrupt leadership, uh, violence. No, I think nothing good has come of it, quite frankly. Saddam Hussein was an evil man. He was a tyrant. But if you talk to ordinary Iraqis, um, and you know, that wonderful series the BBC just did um, once upon a time in Iraq, they will tell you they could send their children to school safely. They could go about their jobs safely. It wasn't a free society, but it was not what they've got today. It was in, and you hate to say it, but it was better. Mm. Agreed. Uh, hi, Margaret. I'm a retired general and now run an NGO, so have experience on both sides of the fence. To what extent has the utility of force shattered the rise and fall of the nation state? Whereas Waterloo was an unconstrained act of violence but achieved a clear political conclusion, modern conflicts in Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, etc., have no end and no obvious purpose. Have our efforts to limit warfare perversely made it more inhumane? No, I think our efforts to limit warfare are right. Um, it sounds very odd, but I think it, it has made it more humane. I, you know, I'm talking to someone who is, is much more of an expert in this than I am. But my, it, my feeling is that the problems in Iraq and Afghanistan is that there was no clear definition of victory. There was a war on terror or there was a war to do regime change. And I think that's dangerous because basically it's open-ended. How do you decide when, when you've actually won? And the thing about Waterloo or the Battle of Trafalgar, it was to destroy the enemy so you could get peace. I mean, the peace was the aim in the end of why the British and their co coalition partners were fighting. And it's seriously one of the problems with, with some of the modern wars we've seen is that there has been no clear definition of what people want to achieve and what the end is. And so I don't think that in itself has made war more violent or nasty. I mean, I think we've seen actually a spread of the laws of war, even in countries where um, there's very little civil society. I think there is an understanding that there should be laws of war. What worries me always, and, and you know, it's, it's constant battle between trying to control war and, and war getting out of control. What worries me is I think a number of powers, including the United States, have ignored or breached some of the laws of war in, in the last few years. And I think that's very dangerous. It will be dangerous, it seems to me, for their own armed forces. Um, you know, all armed forces are better off when there are some, and civilians are better off when there are some agreed understandings of what you can do and what you can't do. And at the moment, those agreed understandings look to me to be a bit shaky. Well, and just as a side follow-up question, I mean, at the end of the book, you talk a bit about cyber threats. What about non-state actors and their capacity to, to wage war? I mean, how, how do they fit into the model and the story of, of, of war? Do, do you feel that they have, have precedents in history, you know, groups like the Assassins, for example, people who have some sort of umbrella cover sometimes from rogue states but are operating to their own ends? How, how do non-state actors fit into war? Well, non-state actors have been there so often. I mean, if you look at the um, Thirty Years' War in the 17th century in Europe, I mean, or, or the, the wars in Italy, in the 16th, 16th century, there were always these freebooting gangs um, who assembled themselves and fought for whatever side or fought for their own interests. And so this is not something new in war. Um, you know, some of them are, are mercenaries, they fight for money. Some of them are simply fighting for their own interest and fighting for loot. And I think we're seeing that again today. And what we've also seen, both in the past and the present, is that those who are weaker will use different methods than those who are strong. They will wage asymmetrical warfare I mean, guerrilla warfare. And the term comes from the, from the Spanish who organized themselves to fight the French invasion during the Napoleonic Wars, is still with us. And these are weapons, uh, acts of terror, um, cyber war, um, destruction of, of, of blowing up buildings. These are things that 
weaker groups will use. Um, they cannot bring down the stronger society, but they can cause an awful lot of damage. So in some ways, I, I think, you know, asymmetrical war and the existence of non-state actors is a very, very old phenomenon in war, and we're certainly seeing it today. And I guess that's exactly right. And I guess that the accommodation with those groups eventually happens in the same way with norms that are established uh, ways of communicating with each other uh, yeah. too. So here, I've got another one. Uh, the world has been remarkably peaceful in the last few years. The number of wars and casualties have stayed remarkably low compared to many years in the past few decades. Why is that? It's a normal well, question. I think the world has been relatively peaceful for certain countries, and the number of casualties has been low for countries like the United States, for Britain, Canada. Um, partly, I think, because our societies tolerate military casualties much less. You know, the Canadians lost some 60,000 in the First World War. I think we've lost less than 200 soldiers in Afghanistan, but we mourn each one, um, and we find that figure too high. But if you look at elsewhere in the world, um, the Iran-Iraq war again, or, or look at the fighting going on in Yemen, or look at the fighting going on in Syria, you can't say the casualties are low. Um, they're very, very high indeed, and they continue to be high. So it really depends where you're looking, and it depends on the particular society, um, how many ca casualties they are willing to sustain or, or, or are obliged to sustain. Okay, so we've got quite a few still to go. So um, let's see. Uh, the Trump era saw uh, saw an unprecedented, so maybe saw an unprecedented reduction in U.S. military activity. Margaret, do you anticipate that the scaling down of the military engagement is going to continue under Biden? It'll be remain to be seen. I mean, it'll be really crucial who he appoints as as foreign secretary and as secretary of state and, and defense secretary. But American expenditure went way up under Trump. Um, you know that hasn't scaled down. And there's still American soldiers in, in, I think, over 100 countries in the world. There's still bases all over the place. I mean, what is clear, I think, is that certainly the Trump administration and I think the American public generally do not want large-scale military interventions around the world. They, they don't see the point of them, and they don't want to see American money and American lives being spent on them. But the scale and the size of the American military establishment is still enormous, and its reach is still huge. Uh, does peace only come where there's a dominant superpower? e.g. the Pax Romana, Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, Pax Sinica? That's an argument that a certain political scientist would make. And, and I think, no, I think they're wrong. Um, sometimes it, if you have a hegemonic power, it, it can provide a sort of stability. Um, but the danger is that others will always be tempted to gang up against it. Um, you know, there, there will be the, what they call the bandwagoning, where a hegemonic power will begin to reduce its own opposition. So the state will, system will become unstable. But we've also seen times when you've had collections of powers cooperating. The concert of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, after, after the Congress of Vienna, was made up of a number of powers. And I think it was quite successful in maintaining a sort of peace and stability in Europe, at least till the middle of the 19th century. So I don't think you need a hegemonic power. It sometimes seems easier if you have one. But I think the alternative is cooperation among like-minded states, which for their own interests don't want war. Okay, uh, here's a sort of follow up to the uh, non state actor. How does the question of irregular forces and militias, such as we have in the US right now, fit into your concepts of warfare? That's from somebody in Vermont who's listening in. Well, I would call that preparation for warfare. And if they start fighting, I would call it war. I don't think war has to be waged by states. I think I, my, my definition is simply that it has to be a group activity. And civil wars are not waged by states. Um, often they're waged by two parts of the state. And so I think. I find it very alarming, actually, that the appearance of our militia in the United States, um, they're wearing military uniform, if you look at them, and they're carrying extraordinary weapons, which you can, in some states, just buy in a corner store, practically. And that worries me. I mean, that's the same sort of thing we saw happening in Italy and Germany and other countries after the First World War. And it's, it's a dangerous omen to me. OK. Uh, have you ever thought about visiting a war zone and reporting on it as a sort of historian journalist? If not, is there a reason why you haven't tried to see war in person? Do you think it would impact your work? I haven't tried to see war in person. I've never been given the opportunity. The closest I came was on the border between Bangladesh and India um, during the war between India and Bangladesh. And I'd gone up with a group of people who were doing relief work. And I heard bullets. Oh, I had what I found out was, was guns being fired and we all were hastily removed. That's the closest I've come. And I've been reluctant, actually. I, I think it would be a sort of voyeurism. Um, and maybe that's wrong of me. But I think to go and, and look at a war simply to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity, I, I would feel very uncomfortable about. Um, it's not that 
I feel being, I, and I don't, I'm not sure being at a distance is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we study the past as historians, we can't be there. And what I try and do is look at what others who have participated in wars have said and read what they have said and try and get some sense of it. But I will never have the direct experience with someone who's been in war, but how much that direct experience would add to my understanding as an historian, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Rod Pearson asks, are nuclear weapons still a deterrent to conflict between great powers today? I would say so far so good. Um, you know, they did keep the peace in the Cold War, although the more we read about some of the incidents that happened when one or other side thought they were under attack, you know, there was the famous, well, just to give one example, a bear tried to, quote, climb over a fence in Montana and people on the base thought this must be a Russian attack, and, and they began to get prepared to go on to high alert. So we, yes, we had a balance of terror, and it kept the peace, but there were times when it came awfully close to breaking down. And I think what is worrying now about nuclear weapons, I think, is, is the spread. Um, you know, nuclear proliferation is something we should be worrying about. A number of countries have acquired nuclear weapons since the end of the Cold War, and others have the capacity or are very close to having the capacity to acquire them. And I think that is worrying. Um, nuclear weapons, for some reason, have a mystique, and nations seem to want to possess them to show that they're big and important nations or powerful nations. And I think it's dangerous. The danger with weapons is once you have them, you're going to be tempted to use them. And so I would have, like to see nuclear weapons firmly under control and, if possible, dismantled. OK. Uh, last question from Cara. Do you think advances in technology will ultimately, she put, uh, ultimately push war away from military war to underground economic cyber bio war as proxies, or do you think military war is a parallel threat as much as it ever was? Is one worse than the other? Uh, and I, I could take refuge and say historians don't predict. Um, I think we're going to see war fought on a number of levels. Um, you know, biological war is outlawed, but there is, of course, we know that research is going on in certain countries as, as it is into chemical warfare. Um, and so it's not something we, we, can, we can put aside. And war is waged through a number of means. It's always been waged through economic war, and it's been waged often through propaganda. And, of course, we now have a whole new field of cyber war. But in the end, I guess I go back to the Clausewitz definition, war is an act of violence intended to compel your enemy to do your will. And it is possible, I suppose, to imagine a war being won through cyber war. But it seems to me that there will probably for some time to come be that element of violence. Someone is going to come and point a gun and say, you do what I tell you. Um, what I think we're also going to see is increasingly high-tech war and the development of all these new weapons which use increasingly artificial intelligence. But we're still going to see the same old miserable punishing wars on the ground, um, which are being fought around the world at the moment, not with the latest weapons, but causing huge amounts of misery and death. So. You know, I, I, it's very hard to predict the future of war, but I suspect we might see it on, on these two different levels. Margaret, it's always a pleasure to talk. So eloquent, erudite, wide-ranging, generous with your time. Uh, the, Margaret's new book, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, available in all good bookshops. It's the perfect Christmas presents for uh, those in your family who are interested in history and warfare yeah. or want to read the work of one of the world's great historians. Um, it's been a pleasure having you this evening. Thank you, Intelligence Squared, for hosting us both. All of you, wherever you are, locked down. I hope we've given you something to think about, um, both the things to worry about and things to be positive about. I think really important part of Margaret's book is to uh, be aware how important studying the past is and how important it is to be aware of what the risks are. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you all. Um, thank you very much for coming.